Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about the moment that the ancient Roman Republic turned itself into an empire. My guest for this conversation is Barry Strauss. Barry Strauss is a professor of history and classics at Cornell University. He's the author of a number of books. His latest that he joins us for a conversation on is called The War That Made the Roman Empire, Antony, Cleopatra, and Octavian at Actium. Barry Strauss, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Thank you. It's great to be here. As I was saying the introduction there, I started thinking to myself when I said, this is the moment that the Roman Republic becomes the Roman Empire. And I thought to myself, well, is it really the the moment? Because didn't they believe even after this period of time that it was still a republic going onward? Yes. I mean, they, they called themselves a republic. I uh, whether they believed it is another question. It's an example of the, the brilliant, relentless communication strategy of the man who became Augustus, that he refused to call it a monarchy, refused to call himself a monarch or a dictator, acted as if it were still the Republic, but uh, officially, but his behavior spoke otherwise. Augustus, I think we're going to end up talking a lot about him, also known as Octavian. So, so walk me through his, his differing names. He had many names. So he's born Gaius Octavius, and his claim to fame is that his mother's mother is Julius Caesar's sister, Julia. So on his mother's side, he is related to the very tip top of the Roman nobility. And uh, Caesar, who doesn't have any legitimate children of his own, takes to young Gaius Octavius and he adopts him posthumously. And when Caesar is killed, the will is read and Gaius Octavius accepts the will and starts calling himself Gaius Julius Caesar. According to Roman custom, he should have been Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus, but he refused to follow that. Yet scholars call him Octavian from Octavianus because it's more neutral. He then calls himself, he gets his Julius Caesar deified, and he calls himself Gaius Julius Caesar, the son of a god, Dei Filius. And then he has himself proclaimed a victorious commander, so he becomes Gaius Julius Caesar, Dei Filius Imperator. And then finally, um, after defeating uh, Mark Antony and Cleopatra, uh, and uh, it becoming clear that he is the sole ruler of Rome, uh, the Senate, no doubt with his approval, gives him the honorary title of the Reverend. And the reverend in Latin is Augustus. So that's how he becomes Augustus. Doesn't he also, and I learned this from, from, from your book, and I did not know this, doesn't he also, I mean, he effectively becomes a, a dictator and creates a system of dictatorship. Julius Caesar, and, and we'll get into what dictator means back then. It's a pretty yeah. fascinating story. You have an office of a dictator with a temporary position to take care of extreme yeah. emergencies. You'll, you'll correct me if I'm wrong on any of that. But uh, um, Augustus would actually, even though he would he sort of taking over as dictator for life, um, bans the word dictator in Rome. Uh, that's, 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 yeah, that's almost entirely correct. Actually, ironically, it was Mark Antony, not Augustus, oh. who banned the word dictator. And Augustus is happy to follow along with that. That became, you know, a fighting word in Rome. Uh, it was why Caesar was killed, because he became dictator for life. So, Augustus is happy not to call himself dictator, but he behaves like the dictator. So, okay, so that's an important uh, point there. Between Julius Caesar and Augustus, we have Mark Antony, who yes. is in control. So Mark, Mark Antony is a, a Roman noble, and um, he is one of Caesar's lieutenants, one of his military and political lieutenants. Uh, he would have loved to have been named as Caesar's heir in his will. He's a distant cousin of Caesar's through his mother, but he's not. Um, and even though he's then in the prime of life around 40 and he's you know, big, physically big and very successful man, he, he serves as consul, one of the two chief officials of Rome. He sees this kid, this 18-year-old Gaius Octavius, suddenly become Caesar's heir. Uh, an heir to his name and to most of his fortune, and this bothers him a lot. So they are, they're instant rivals. Coming back to Augustus, and you said earlier that he would deify uh, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar is obviously yeah. an important player in, in this game. What does it mean? Why is he deified, and what does it mean to deify someone? Is this a common practice in ancient Rome? 
It's not a common practice in ancient Rome. It's a practice that was used in the in the East uh, uh, by Greek-speaking kingdoms whom the Romans looked down on. Uh, but things begin to change with Julius Caesar, who becomes, in effect, a king after um, fighting a civil war and defeating all comers in, in, in the Roman world. Uh, as Shakespeare says, he, he, he bestrides the world like a colossus. And uh, Caesar's offered deification in his lifetime. Nothing really happens about it. And then after his death, uh, he is, in fact, deified. So what does deification mean? Uh, the Romans were pagans, and they had a series of gods. They, being deified, it would not bring you into the top rank of the gods. It's a different word than deification. It's actually more like divinization. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference to us. Um, I suppose it's it's becoming like a holy man, a holy a holy person. Uh, and it was a recognition of a celebrity and an achievement that was beyond all human, normal human capability. But it, was, it certainly gave Octavian bragging rights because he could call himself the son of a god, the son of a deified person. Uh, it's the same word as our word uh, diva uh, for you know, a great opera singer. A di the Italians also talk about divo for a male opera singer. And so Caesar is a, div a divos. He's He's deified in this way. So somewhere between celebrity and sainthood. Is is this, well, that's what I was going to ask. Is this sort of a precursor to when we would have a, a Roman church, Catholic church, that would grant sainthood to people? Well, only in a very, very vague way. I mean, Christian sainthood is, is something really, really different. But it's certainly a recognition of uh, more than ordinary status, and the Romans would have said of a, of a closeness to closeness to the gods. Uh, of course, Christians would look at it in, in, from a different point of view. How old is the Republic at this time that we get this war between uh, with Ca Antony and Cleopatra against Octavian? So the Republic is almost about five hundred years old. It's um, you know becomes a Republic in uh, 509, 508. Uh, BC, so that's almost 500 years. What does a republic mean? Well, for the Romans, uh, a republic meant, first of all, not a monarchy. The republic was founded in a rebellion against the Roman monarchy, and um, the kings were thrown out, the republic was formed, and uh, a republic, in our terms, it's, it's dominated by an oligarchy of a small number of families. They're, they have an inherited position, although it is possible for a few people to work their way in from outside. They're noble and they're, they're wealthy uh, uh, to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, but it's not simply an oligarchy because the, the people have a certain say in the Roman Republic. There are popular assemblies and there are annual elections. And in order to be elected to office, you have to, um, you have to become a candidate. Uh, you have to beseech the people, you have to electioneer. And sometimes you actually have to pay people to, to vote for you. So it's a funny kind of system. Uh, it's much more oligarchic than our system. It's less democratic than Greek, ancient Greek democracy. Right. It's mostly oligarchic, but it's not completely oligarchic. The people do have some say. But there are elements of democracy in it. Were, were they conscious of democracy when this occurred? Were they conscious of Athenian yeah. democracy? Yeah. They knew about Athenian democracy. They knew about Greek democracy, and they didn't like it. They thought that Greek democracy gave the people too much power, and that in order to have a good government, you really needed to have a balance. You needed to give the bulk of the power to the few, the wealthy, the educated, uh, while also consulting the people uh, to bring them uh, to bring them into into the system. So one difference is that in Greek democracy, they have assembly meetings, and you get to sit down on wooden benches. And you get when you want to speak, you you stand up and go to the speaker's platform. The Romans didn't allow people to sit down because they thought that would, that would encourage people too much to speak, and they didn't want ordinary people to be encouraged to speak. 
Likewise, in Athenian democracy, most public offices were chosen by lottery, and they were mostly held by by boards. So instead of having a dog catcher, let's say there'd be a, do a board of dog catchers. That's a way of making sure that if somebody gets through who's not all that good, there'd be others on the board. And they work by committees. In Rome, they did sometimes have boards, but pu public officers were chosen by election. The Athenians thought election was a bad idea because it could be a popularity contest or it could reward wealthy people or educated people. The Romans thought, you got to do that. Um, that's, that's the way the government should work so there are some similarities but there are also a lot of differences yeah they, they wanted the aristocracy to rule or the oligarchy right which i guess is the other side of the aristocracy yes they they probably would have called them ar aristocracy they proudly call themselves the best men the optimates the best men that, that's what isn't that what the, the original greek meaning of the word aristocracy of the best yes yes it does it means rule by rule of the best yeah and optimates is just a latin version of that now there is a decay a political decay that is occurring here with the roman republic as we get into the time that you write about in this war the war the book the war that made the roman empire uh well, th th there's like a, a hundred year civil war that's that's been there is, raging there is i mean uh, rome is a victim of its own success uh, the Romans conquer this enormous empire, which at the end of the Republic stretches from Belgium and the Netherlands to um, uh, to uh, to the Levant, to the Levant, certainly to to Syria and North Africa, uh, and they're now ruling over tens of millions of people. But they have essentially the same political system they had when they were a small city state. And they think that the small oligarchy of just a few hundred families is going to govern, what, 40, 50 million people. You can't really do this. It's not possible, especially because the Roman army is not a very big army. At its height, it's only an army of 300,000 men. Well, actually, it gets bigger at a certain point. But let's say in general, in the empire, it's an, uh, it's an army of 300,000 men. How are you govern 50 million people with an army of 300,000 men? You can't. You have to get buy-in from the local elites. And yet, the rulers of the Republic were unwilling to make that kind of a concession. They really thought they could go on forever, but it couldn't. Uh, furthermore, they mistreated the ordinary Romans and Italians who had served as soldiers and had, had built the empire by conquering foreign people. So they, they created a large class of poor men who were willing and eager to follow any military commander who promised them money and land. And all of this destabilizes the Republic, uh, enormous instability. And the Romans weren't wise enough to make the compromises that might have allowed them to keep the Republic. Yeah. So yes, it's a long civil war and a long period of instability. Yeah, and we, we could we could do several hours just on that alone. Uh, but Absolutely. but getting yeah. to, to your story here, if we we'll pick it up with Julius Caesar, he capitalizes on this dynamic. Right. right. He does. He does. He's not the first, but he. Um, he is, he's one of the best, one of the most talented. He's uh, a genius, a triple threat, as it were. He's a, a, a brilliant politician, a brilliant general, and a brilliant communicator, a, a great writer whose books we still read today. Um, and he has the sky's the limit as far as his opinion of himself, especially after conquering Gaul, which was a major achievement, where he's treated like a king. He begins to think of himself as a king. And he really comes to the conclusion that the only solution for Rome and its problems is to have one family dominated, and that family should be his family. He doesn't come to that conclusion right away, and it's only as a result of a lot of opposition from others, but that's eventually uh, how, he, how he ends up. So yes, he, he is a popularist, and in Roman politics, partly has a connotation of populist, not entirely. He's He's a, he's, in a, he's in a member of the nobility himself. He's not a man of the people. And he has no intention of bringing democracy to Rome. But he's more sympathetic to the ordinary people than uh, the, uh, the best men are. He works through the institutions of the ordinary people, so the assemblies rather than the Senate. And he brings a kind of relief and, and wealth sharing, more willing to share the wealth with the ordinary people than the than the optimates, than the oligarchy is. So in, in all of those ways, he uses um, popular sentiment. He also is wise enough to realize that you have to work with the provincial elites. 
that you can't treat the people you've conquered in Spain, in Gaul, in Northern Italy, in the former Yugoslavia, in Syria, et cetera, and so forth. You can't treat them uh, as if they're just your subjects. You need to bring them in to some extent, slowly, but surely you need to bring them into the inner circle. And that's the only way to run the empire. And that's another of the reasons for his success. So in, in claiming that his family, and that's interesting when you say only a single family should rule. So it is a family that rules? <laughs> so, um, you know, if we want to understand the way the Roman Republic worked, um, I'll use an analogy that's a bit tired and it's been used by many others, but that is the mafia. Uh, if you think of the mafia in which there are a series of families that govern, to some extent, the Roman Republic was like that. There were these few um more than five families in the mafia, um, dozens of families that, that governed the Republic. And they were very jealous of each other and insisted that no one of them should dominate the political system. But the, the infighting, the quarreling, the faction fighting between these families was just too great uh, for the system to be stable. Um, I think that if the, the, the heads of these families had had, had, had woke up and sm smelled the coffee, uh, if they saw the need to respond to the needs of the poor people of Italy and to bring in the elites of the empire, they could have kept the Republic, but they didn't. And that allowed an adventurer like Caesar uh, to use all this new support and say, you know what, my family is going to be the dominant family in Rome. It's going to be uh, we'll still have other families that have a share of power, but one family is going to be superior to all other families. That's going to be the Julian family. And that was totally unacceptable to the oligarchy, utterly unacceptable to the oligarchy. And the people weren't so thrilled about it either. They really weren't. But they were so embroiled within their own infighting against each other that 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 threatened that that is what brought the cracks into the, or maybe one of the major things that brought the cracks into the Republic. I mean, hate to say yeah. it, but it kind of sounds familiar. It sounds all too familiar. I mean, one of the things we, that history you know, shows us, and Romans are an example, is that um, there's no such thing as permanency. There's no such thing as permanence. Every system changes. And one of the measures by which we judge whether a political system is good or not is its flexibility and its ability to uh, adopt to change, to adapt, keeping the best of the old while accepting the new. And the Romans, in, their, in the heyday of the Roman Republic, the Romans had been brilliant about that. They really had been brilliant at tough-minded compromise. But they'd lost that ability. Uh, and partly, success spoiled them. Too much wealth, too much power. It went to everyone's head. And it turned out that the only way they could restabilize was through civil war. And then sadly, ultimately, having a, a monarchy that limited freedom of speech. Because there's no doubt that uh, although there are many things about the Roman Republic we shouldn't mourn, the one thing we should mourn is the freedom of speech that, uh, that people had in the Republic. They lose that in the empire. That's interesting, because I know freedom of speech was important in ancient Athens, Mm -hmm. um, especially if you were a citizen, which meant that you were you were a male. Um, right. But at its height in Athenian democracy, regardless of right. wealth, you were able to participate as a citizen. Uh, again, women, right. slaves were not, immigrants right. were not, but but all males, regardless of wealth, were uh, citizens were able to participate. Uh, and free right. speech was a fundamental aspect to that. Yes. Um, I, yes. I didn't I didn't realize you also had that in Rome. Absolutely, yes. The Romans, uh, the Romans really cared about freedom of speech. Now, for the elite, it's particularly the freedom of speech for the elite to speak in the Senate, to say what they thought. Um, but it was for ordinary, ordinary citizens as well. But that becomes uh, a casualty of the empire, where the emperors uh, crack down on, the crack down on dissidents. Tell me about Julius Caesar's assassination then, and how this fits into your story. So Caesar was assassinated on the Ides of March, March 15th, 44 BC. He was assassinated by a posse of senators. Uh, there are over 60 in the conspiracy. He seems to be wounded by only, he only has 23 wounds when he, the day that he is killed. Um, and um, one of the things that's really striking about this conspiracy is they do it themselves. They don't hire assassins. 
The senators, the conspirators insist on killing Caesar themselves with their own hands, with their own daggers, at a meeting of the Roman Senate. And they were doing it this way in part because they wanted to show that this was, this was a, a semi-official deed. They were not murderers. They weren't cutthroats, but they were acting in what they saw as an official capacity to save the state from a tyrant. Also, Romans believed that the founder of Rome, they believed there was a legendary founder of Rome named Romulus. They believed that he had become too big for his toga, as it were, and that he was assassinated by a group of senators. So they saw themselves as reenacting an event from, from the history of Rome. But, but why did they turn on Caesar? The conspirators included both Caesar's political enemies um, and his political friends, not all of his friends, uh, but there were political friends in on the conspiracy as well. And I think they joined it because they felt that Caesar had gone beyond what they'd authorized him to do. They were willing to have Caesar win out in the factional fighting of the Republic and become the dominant man in the Republic, but they were not willing to have him become a king. A month or so before he's assassinated, he's declared dictator perpetuo, dictator in perpetuity, dictator for life. Nothing like this had ever existed in Rome before. Originally, the dictator is just a six-month office to handle emergencies. Uh, and then there's a dictator a generation before Caesar named Sulla, who was dictator for a vague period, but he steps down after uh, two years. Caesar's then dictator for a year, then appointed dictator a year again, then he's appointed dictator for 10 years, and then finally dictator in perpetuity. On top of that, he flirts with the trappings of monarchies. He starts wearing the clothes that the kings of Rome had worn centuries before. There's a public ceremony the month before he's assassinated in February, uh, where Mark Anthony offers him the kingship and Caesar turns it down and ostentatiously says, let this be recorded in the public records. I was offered the kingship and I turned it down. And a lot of people think, uh-oh, is this a trial balloon to see what people would like? And then there is the problem of his mistress. Caesar has a wife, a Roman noble, but he also has a mistress. He's had many mistresses, but his most prominent mistress of the moment is the most powerful queen in the, in the Mediterranean world. That's Cleopatra. Um, she says that her son is her son by Caesar. Caesar never claims him, but he allows her to name the boy Ptolemy Caesar. He allows her to give him his name. And where is Cleopatra on the Ides of March 44 BC? She's not in Egypt. She's in Rome, living in Caesar's palace. No, not Caesar's palace. It's called Caesar's Villa. It's right outside the city of Rome on the other side of the Tiber. She can't live in the city because foreign monarchs are not allowed to enter the sacred boundary of the Roman Republic. But she's right there, and many people, including Cicero, see her, they know she's there. So here's this guy, Caesar, who says, I'm not a king, I'm just dictator in perpetuity, and I kind of dress like a king, and my mistress is a queen, but I'm not a king. <laughs> <laughs> That's really too much for a lot of people in Rome. Plus, he starts muscling some of his old allies out of the top position, and they can see that he's favoring his great nephew, Gaius Octavius, and they don't like it. Um, they don't like the favor he's showing this guy. They can smell the fact that he wants his family to be the dominant family in Rome, and they want to stop it. That's why they assassinate him. There's a lot there I want to unpack with yeah, you. Yeah. But let me just, one, one last question about the dictatorship, because this is, this is really, you know, the, the term dictator is such a negative one today, and yeah. perhaps rightfully so. Uh, but living in a republic representational democracy that we live in now in times of emergency, you could see why it might be uh, why one would consider having an office, a temporary office of a dictator who can come in and deal with things quickly and efficiently right. uh, when, yeah. you, when you need it done. Uh, obviously, there are major dangers there, as, as we mm -hmm. see in, in Rome, but right. it's an interesting concept, this office yeah. of a dictatorship that's temporary. Yeah, I mean... Um in Britain, they have something called the Defense of the Realm Act, which can be invoked during wartime emergencies, which is sort of like a dictatorship, but not quite the same. And in the U.S., in the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas corpus, and there was a lot of debate as to whether he had the right to do it or not. But most people, I think, shrugged their shoulders and said, well, okay, we're in a great national emergency. So I think countries do this uh, willy-nilly. They don't have an official dictatorship but they don't like it to last for a long time and for the dictator to be the dictator in perpetuity that's 
that's another thing. Yeah. Yeah. I guess like we have emergency powers. That might be. We have emergency powers. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we have that makes sense. Powers. Yeah. This is Letters on Politics, and we are in conversation with Barry Strauss. Barry Strauss is a professor of history and classics at Cornell University. He is the author of the book, The War That Made the Roman Empire, Antony, Cleopatra, and Octavian at Actium. Okay, I think we've worked our way up to this mm -hmm. war. Cle Cleopatra, in living in Rome, uh, she's she's queen of, of Egypt, but she's yes. living in Rome. Is this unusual? It's unusual. It's not totally unusual. Her father had spent time in Rome as well. I mean, Egypt's independence hangs by a thread. Egypt is independent only on the sufferance of, of Rome, uh, which is uh, a power that Egypt cannot possibly defeat. Uh, the Romans have allowed Egypt to be independent in part because Egypt's a very wealthy place and Egyptians bribe Roman politicians, and in part because of the oligarchy. Uh, because of the oligarchy, no one wants any one politician to get the credit for conquering Egypt. Because when the Romans conquer a place, they acquire a lot of clients, local people who are uh, loyal to and in the hip pocket, as it were, of the conqueror. And the Romans didn't want any one person to do that. So Egypt maintained its independence, but barely. So uh, her father had spent a lot of time in Rome, and it's reasonable for Cleopatra to spend time in Rome. Um, no one can be safe on the throne of Egypt without having Roman on their support. But also she is Caesar's mistress and she wants to have another child by him. Uh, they, there are rumors in the ancient sources in Cicero that she is in fact pregnant again by Caesar uh, and she has a miscarriage after his death. But if she went to Rome and became pregnant a second time by Caesar, then it's in a certain sense it was mission accomplished. I mean, she went there to do that and and almost succeeded. Except what, for what, why did she? Why did she want this? Was it was it for political reasons? Was it for uniting the empires? I think it was for political and personal reasons. So um, uh, politically, it is a way of securing uh, the independence of Egypt, uh, of Egypt. If Caesar and his heirs are the dominant people in Roman politics, then they might be happier with an Egypt that has uh, Caesar's son on the throne also and this is speculate speculative uh, cleopatra is a woman with a very high opinion of herself a lot of dignity she is a ptolemy and her family is descended from uh alexander the great's general uh the first ptolemy ptolemy son of lagus i think in a way she feels there's almost no one in the world worthy of her as as clear as Caesar, the, the first man in Rome, and it is almost her right uh, to to marry with him. I, I think Cleopatra was a brilliant woman, and Caesar was a genius. I think the two of them probably there was probably real genuine electricity between the two of them. And their affair is not just an affair of convenience, I'm convinced. Of course, so much of our understanding and actually the the identity and who was Cleopatra uh, Cleopatra is hotly debated today. Um, yes. But for many years, yes. our, our idea of her stemmed from what, the actress Elizabeth Taylor and then yeah, William right. Shakespeare's uh, right. Anthony right. and Cleopatra. Right. How right. would you describe Cleopatra? Well, um, I would say that Cleopatra is less like Elizabeth Taylor than she is like Elizabeth I of England, Catherine the Great, Indira Gandhi, Maggie Thatcher, Golda Meir. I mean, she is a, she's a leader. She is a ruler of her country. She's an administrator. She's a, she's a great strategist. Uh, she happens to be a woman, which makes her unusual in history, especially in ancient history, though not totally unique. I think we need to see her in that way. Uh, we do depend on Shakespeare, and Shakespeare gets his information from Plutarch's Life of Mark Antony, which is a brilliant work, but it's semi-fictionalized. We have other sources. Uh, fortunately, we have a lot of coins that Cleopatra issued, uh, and they present a different picture of Cleopatra than than the, the one we get. She's she's not a beauty. She's meant to look masculine, and whether she really looked masculine or not, we don't know. It may be that she wanted people to think of her a king, so they make her look masculine. Um, in her later coins, she is bejeweled, bedecked out with jewelry, and her hair is. Uh, very, very carefully quaffed. It looks like cornrows, to tell you the truth. Um, 
She looks majestic. She looks absolutely majestic. So not perhaps Elizabeth Taylor looks majestic as well, but even more of a power broker than Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, about her uh, ethnicity, so Cleopatra was certainly descended from the Macedonian dynasty, and there was a Persian uh, in the family tree as well. She may have been part Egyptian. There's reason to think that her mother and perhaps her grandmother were members of an Egyptian priestly family. Uh, and if that's the case, she would have been part African. Uh, beyond that, it's really hard to say. She was the only Macedonian dynasty leader who spoke Egyptian. Is that correct? Yes, that's absolutely right. She's the only one who spoke Egyptian, which is also, you know, um, a straw in the wind, as they say, to suggest that perhaps her mother was Egyptian and taught her Egyptian. But she spoke at least seven languages, so it's not proof positive. It's impressive to speak seven languages, though. It is. Well, she was a very, very bright person, very bright. This this is an old dynasty. I mean, it's pretty remarkable that yeah. no one before her learned Egyptian. It is. It is absolutely remarkable. Um, but they saw themselves as the exploiters of Egypt. Yeah. Originally, they they really disdained the Egyptians. They they built a new city, Alexandria, on the coast of Egypt, and uh, that's, Alexandria is always referred to in the ancient sources as Alexandria beside Egypt, Alexandria next to Egypt. You know, in a phenomenon that's not unknown to us today, it called itself the city. It saw itself like San Francisco or New York as kind of separate from the rest of the country. It was, I mean, it was um, a city, there are three main populations in Alexandria. Uh, there was uh, the Greek speakers, Greek and Macedonians who spoke Greek. There were the native Egyptians. And there was a big Jewish uh, community in Alexandria as well. And there were other foreigners living there as well. But it's it's different from the rest of, of Egypt in that sense. It's also a port city open to the world. The Egyptians had not been great sailors. Uh, it's only when Greeks and Macedonians take over that Egypt becomes a great naval power as well. Uh, and, and, they, and we all think of the the library uh, yeah, the, yes. and the lighthouse, but I think of the library of, of Alexandria. Yeah. It's a it's a great place of, of learning uh, because of this yeah. library. Some of the texts, many of them, have been destroyed, but we still have some of the the, the texts from or the stories, anyways, from from the past, including the the organization of such books as like the Iliad and the Odyssey and yeah. and such things. Yeah. Absolutely right. And yeah, the library was. Uh, the library and the museum, as it was called, which is more like a university in our terms, uh, they really were the intellectual center or one of the great intellectual center of the Greek-speaking world for centuries. And they had huge impact on Rome as well. But this is a colonial power, this this Macedonian dynasty. in, in It Egypt. is. It, it's a colonial power. The Egyptians, over the last century or so of Ptolemaic rule, the, uh, the native Egyptians gained more and more power. They were able to take some of the power back. Uh, there never were that many Macedonians or Greeks who emigrated to Egypt. And the only way to fill out the army and the police was to um, enroll native Egyptians, uh, which they did. Uh, and some of those native Egyptians became honorary Macedonians. They get Macedonian names. You meet lots of people who have two names. They have an Egyptian name and then they have a Greek name. Uh, and Egyptian religion becomes very popular with Greek speakers. And we even have texts from Greek speakers who say, I'm being mistreated by the native Egyptians. They are, they're biased against me because I'm Greek. So uh, it's clear that it's not just a one-way street, that, that Egyptians are gaining more and more power, uh, certainly by Cleopatra's day. So we have the assassination, now coming back to where we were before, of Julius yeah. Caesar. Yeah. Um, I guess there's a, a vacuum that that's to be filled. Sounds like it's first filled by Mark Anthony. Yes. So uh, in part by, by Anthony, who is the consul, but uh, also by the assassins. The assassins call themselves the liberators, and they want to govern Rome, but they quickly run into opposition from Caesar's soldiers, Caesar's veterans. Um, 
Uh, they're not very clever about it. They don't understand that the key to power at this point, or one of the keys to power, is you have to pay off the soldiers. If they wanted to win over Caesar's soldiers, they should have given them a raise, but they don't. Uh, and so they're, fo they're forced to flee from Rome, um, yet some of them are still in Italy and there's a power struggle. It's rather complicated. Uh, young Octavian was not in Rome at the time. Caesar was planning to invade the Persian Empire. I know this gets very complicated at the time of his assassination. He was about to leave Rome on a multi-year military campaign. And his great nephew, Gaius Octavius, was already at military headquarters, which is located across the Adriatic in what is today Albania. Well, he works his way back to Rome, goes back to Italy, works his way back to Rome, and immediately starts showing how Machiavellian he was. I know it's an anachronism before Machiavelli, he was Machiavellian before the letter. He uh, makes friends with Caesar's supporters, but also makes friends with the Senate and the party of the assassins and raises a private army. He outbids Mark Antony for the support of some of Caesar's troops, raises a private army and makes war on Mark Antony, who in turn is making war on the uh, assassins in Northern Italy. And he drives Mark Antony out of Northern Italy across, and Antony escapes with his, most of his army across the Alps to Gaul. Antony then turns around, wins the support of the Roman legions in Gaul. And Octavian says, on second thought, I want to make a deal with Antony. I'm going to turn against the Senate. So Antony comes back to uh, Italy with a new army, and he and Octavian and a third figure named Lepidus, they make a deal to divide control of the Roman state among the three of them. It's called a triumvirate, uh, about a year and a half after Caesar's assassination. They then institute a series of purges. The most famous victim is Cicero, who is assassinated. Uh, and uh, they they take over the they take over the Roman state and they build an army to head eastward and fight uh, the leading surviving assassins, uh, Brutus and Cassius, who we hear all about in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, and they defeat them in the battles. There are two battles at Philippi in the autumn of 42 BC, and then they divide up the Roman world with Mark Antony getting the east. Octavian getting Italy and most of the West, and Lepidus getting a small part of the West. And everything we know about Roman history up to now suggests that the Roman Empire ain't big enough for two top dogs, that sooner or later these two guys will come to blows. And, and so now it's 42 BC. Much of the next 10 years is about the drama, at times the soap opera, of the relationship between Octavian and Antony as to who will be the top dog in Rome. They, they fairly quickly get rid of Lepidus. <laughs> yeah, because we most people don't know that name. Uh, yeah, the, no. <laughs> the, the triumvirate. Um, yeah. Is this the idea of now, if we go back to the, the mafia analogy, yes. that this is just going to be three families now that rule? Pretty much, yeah. They're going to be three families that rule. Um, it's you know, there's nothing in the Roman constitution. The Ro I mean, Romans don't have a written constitution, but they have a customary constitution. There's nothing in it that would allow this sort of thing. Uh, this is revolutionary, basically, revolutionary government, but the three of them with their armies are going to run the state. Yeah. The, the Senate still exists, but it... Yes, the Senate still exists. It but, still exists. But it yeah, well, it dethrones it or defangs it or... It's much less powerful than it's been before, much less powerful. When, for instance, Octavian, who now I think is 20 years old, he wants to be named a consul, and you need to be 35 to be a consul in Rome. Um, the story is told that one of Oct when the senators say, well, we can't elect him consul, one of Octavian's centurions goes into the Senate house, pulls out his sword and says, then this will elect him consul. So it's a pretty violent period a pretty violent period and it's also marked it's marked by a lack of political principles and an absolute abundance of traitors and turncoats people change sides at the drop of a hat in this period so now we have mark anthony mm -hmm. against octavian right how, how does mark anthony then hook up no, <laughs> no pun intended uh, right. with cleopatra 
So Cleopatra is, you know, the most powerful independent ruler in the Eastern Mediterranean, and she's also uh, enormously wealthy. Um, Antony accuses her of having um, been willing to, too willing to negotiate with one of Caesar's assassins, with Cassius, um, which she sort of was in order to try to save her throne, though she did try to stay away from it. And he calls her to a conference uh, in uh, southern Turkey, in the city of Tarsus, which is now southern Turkey. And she goes there, but she makes one of the most famous grand entrances in history. It's in Shakespeare, memorably, when she comes in on a gilded barge, dressed as Aphrodite, fanned by uh, boys who are meant to be Cupids. And she, uh, uh, instead of going to Antony, makes him come to her, giving him the message that Aphrodite has come to play with the god Dionysus for the control of Asia. Now, in the Eastern Mediterranean now for centuries, all self-respecting rulers identify themselves with a god. It's just the way things are done. Cleopatra identifies herself with two goddesses. For her Greek-speaking subjects, it's Aphrodite, who's the god of love, but she's also a god of war. And for her uh, Egyptian subjects, it's Isis, uh, who is uh, the god of motherhood and of eternal life. Um, and Antony has already identified himself with Dionysus. Dionysus, of course, is also Bacchus, the god of drinking, but he's also the god who conquered Asia. And he's the god of Alexander the Great. Alexander identified himself with Dionysus because Dionysus had conquered Asia. And so Cleopatra is suggesting to Antony, let's make an arrangement. We'll be political allies and we'll be public relations allies as well. And of course, she's also offering her bed. And she's a very valuable bedmate because she's the former main squeeze of Julius Caesar. She brings prestige with her. And so Antony accepts and the two of them become lovers after this famous meeting. She becomes pregnant and gives birth to twins, Antony's twin children. But they don't see each other for several years after, after this. Uh, Antony, in the meantime, almost comes to blows with Octavian. Uh, uh, and the uh, quarrel is settled, uh, mafia style, through a dynastic marriage. Uh, in, in, in the mafia, um, mafia brides often are members of one family who are quasi hostages as members of uh, when they marry into another family. Octavian marries his sister, Octavia, to Antony. As chance has it, both Octavia and Antony are widowed. But that wouldn't have mattered. The Romans are big on divorcing to make dynastic marriages. Anyhow, and now Octavian and, and Antony have this, they, they, they patch up their quarrels. Uh, they agree to uh, share the Roman world the two of them, between the two of them. And Octavia is the go-between. And she goes off with Antony to Athens, where she gives birth to two children, two daughters, which probably didn't endear her to a male chauvinist culture like Rome, where she didn't give him a son. Antony already had a son with Cleopatra, and he had... Uh, two Roman sons with an, with an earlier wife. Um, the marriage has its ups and downs. I argue that Octavia is not loyal to Antony, that her, she's loyal to her brother. And she plays a big role in the, in the political negotiations of the next few years and the, the times when they almost come to blows again. They almost go to war again. And Octavia is the one who negotiates a peace agreement, but it's an agreement that's suspiciously favorable to Octavian rather than to Antony. These two sides, Octavian on one side, Mark Antony and Cleopatra on the other, are, mm. are they offering two different views of uh, yeah, what the future I, I, of the Roman Empire or Republic? I get, I'm sure everyone's claiming it's still the Republic. We're, we're trying everyone's to say Everyone's claiming the it's the Republic. Um, you know, Neither one would really be acceptable to a Roman conservative, and yet they prefer Antony to Octavian for two reasons. Uh, well, several reasons. One, Antony is a member of the Roman nobility. He's one of them, one of us, they would have said. Octavian is a ne'er-do-well. His father was, from the point of view of the nobility, uh, middle class. He was a very wealthy man, but he didn't come from the Roman nobility. Octavian's only a member of the nobility through his mother. 
For another thing, Octavian is in Rome. It's hard to avoid him. And he, Octavian starts doing things that look very suspicious to the Senate. The main thing he does is he starts building a dynastic tomb, a gigantic mausoleum. Uh, which is somewhat reminiscent of Egyptian pyramids and Etruscan mausolea. He's building it on the outskirts of the city of Rome. And you can still see the ruins of it today, Augustus's mausoleum. Antony's far away. It's true that he is playing with a queen, but it's pretty far from Rome. And the message his, his ally sent to the Roman Senate is he would be a better master than Octavian. He's not going to breathe down your neck. He understands what the nobility wants in a way that Octavian doesn't. So they, the, 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 the few diehard Republicans left prefer Antony, though it's really, it's not much of a choice between these two guys. That's interesting. Um, going into this war, into this battle at Actium, I, I think this yeah. is 31 BCE. Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, you, you, one would have predicted a successful outcome for Mark Antony and, and Cleopatra. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, the technology of their ships, the number of their ships, and the wealth that they had, you would have expected Antony and Cleopatra oh. to win. They had a bigger fleet, and their ships were state-of-the-art. Uh, they had reinforced prows, which meant they particularly effective at ramming. And they also had a small number of uh, what we might call uh, super tankers, super big ships, that were capable of being used to break into harbor defenses. So they could have been used to invade Italy and uh, attempt to take Brundisium or Tarentum, the two fortified towns in, in the south. Um, furthermore, uh, and Octavian has a lot of political opposition in Italy. Uh, the Senate, uh, at least a third of the Senate flees to Antony and, uh, in the east. They don't want Octavian. And there are riots in Italy over the taxes that Octavian has to raise to pay for his fleet, because unlike Antony, so Antony has the wealth of Egypt. He has basically unlimited money bags. Octavian doesn't. He has to levy taxes to pay for his fleet. It's very unpopular. So uh, if Antony had been a great, real, a truly great general, I think he could have won. I think he had the resources to, to win and maybe win easily. Uh, what Octavian has is, first of all, he has experience. He has more experience at sea than Antony does because his fleet, he's had to build a fleet to fight the son of Pompey the Great, Sextus Pompey, who had a little naval empire going based in Sicily. And uh, Octavian also has a fantastic admiral, Marcus Agrippa, who's one of the unsung heroes of Roman generalship and and admiralship, and uh, who's just worth his weight in gold. And Octavian's a very, very good leader. He understands that he can't do everything himself. And he understands that he has to bow to um, Agrippa's tactical skill. Octavian's a great strategist, but he's not a great tactician. He's not great at leading operations. He's not a field commander. Agrippa is. Octavian knows it, and that gives him a real leg up. And then Antony just does everything wrong. He just, not everything, but he does a lot, a lot, a lot of things wrong. As we've been more recently reminded, it's not enough to have great weapons and numerical superiority. You need to, you need to know what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, moving ourselves forward here, because we're, we're almost yeah. out of time, but yeah. um, we had you on several years ago to talk about your, uh, another one of your books, 10 Caesars, and we really got yeah. into uh, Octavian becoming Augustus and sort of right. his genius yeah. in the decades that would form, uh, even administratively speaking, I, I think the the Roman what we consider the Roman Empire after the Republic. But yeah. but I want to add what what ends up happening to Cleopatra in all of this after after they lose the war. Yeah, so uh, Cleopatra goes back to Alexandria and she brings uh, Mark Antony with her, uh, and she works on several escape plans. The most I think the one that she goes furthest on is building a new fleet to take her and her family to India, where the Ptolemies have re relations. Is, is this because Rome's now taking over Egypt and, and Alexandria yeah, after sees, the war? She sees that coming. It takes about a year before the Romans take over Egypt, but she sees that coming. So she wants to escape. 
But she's made enemies with uh, an Arab people, uh, the Nabataean Arabs, and they, they burn the fleet and prevent her from, from taking it. Uh, she and Antony toy with the idea of going to Spain and leading an insurgency there, but nothing ever comes of that. Uh, she may be involved, there's a mutiny of the troops in Italy that forces Octavian home. Um, and I'd like to think she had something to do with that, though there's no real proof of that. Uh, but when all else fails, it's, I think she's ready to throw Antony under the bus. She wants to negotiate with Octavian to try to, if not stay on the throne of Egypt, then at least let her son stay on the throne of Egypt. And failing that, at least let her children live. And I think in the end, that's what she does negotiate with, with Octavian. Cleopatra's end is very controversial. And we don't know what really was said in the famous meeting that she has with Octavian after Anthony has committed suicide. And she encouraged Anthony to commit suicide. But I'd like to think that uh, through hints and uh, winks and nods, she agreed that she would commit suicide if Octavian lets her children live. And I think she does commit suicide. Octavian lets her three children by Antony live. He does not let her son by Caesar live. He has Caesarian murdered uh, rather brutally. And uh, Octavian's tutor and his public relations guy in Egypt, an Alexandrian named Arius, makes a terrible pun. There's a line in Homer that says, too many kings is a bad thing. And in Greek, it sounds like too many Caesars. So he says, too many Caesars is a bad thing. So Octavian can be the only Caesar, and Caesar's birth child, because um, uh, Caesarian has to be murdered. Uh, Cleopatra, as you know, in Shakespeare, kills herself through the uh, bite of a snake. Uh, I was, the ancient sources say we really don't know if she was killed by the bite of a snake or by uh, poison. And there are some scholars who say neither. She was really murdered by Octavian, but he created this fairy story of how she committed suicide to make her look bad. I don't believe that because her own physician wrote about her death afterwards, and I don't believe he would have been in on the uh, uh, the, uh, the evil tale. I was skeptical about the snakes, but I consulted a colleague of mine who's a herpetologist, and he assured me that the snake story is plausible. So she might actually have been killed by the bite of a snake, just as Shakespeare has it. Purposefully. I mean, they found a poisonous yes. snake, and then yes. and that's so how she would do yeah. it. Yeah, so Alexandria was the greatest medical center of the ancient world, and the sources tell us that Cleopatra experimented on condemned prisoners. Can you imagine that? As to what was the most painless way to die and decided that this was the best way to go. <laughs> Barry Strauss has been our guest. Again, Barry Strauss, Sprout, again, Barry Strauss is a professor of history and classics at Cornell University. He has joined us for a conversation about his book. It's called The War That Made the Roman Empire, Antony, Cleopatra, and Octavian at Actium. Barry Strauss, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure.